and he may request that as well today. We're waiting for Congressman Tom Lantos of California to gavel these proceedings to order. The House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing is continuing its investigation into alleged fraud and mismanagement in administering federal housing contracts at the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the previous administration. At today's hearing, we will continue our examination of abuses, waste, favoritism, and mismanagement of housing programs during the administration of HUD Secretary Samuel Pierce. On May 25, more than five months ago, Secretary Pierce appeared voluntarily before this subcommittee and testified at length about his stewardship at HUD. Subsequent testimony by other witnesses and documents uncovered by subcommittee investigators were at odds with Mr. Pierce's testimony. Accordingly, by letter of July 8, I invited Mr. Pierce to testify further. At his request, Mr. Pierce's return appearance was scheduled for August 3, the last day before the Congressional District work period. In late July, Mr. Pierce informed the subcommittee that he was having difficulty obtaining counsel and asked for a postponement. I agreed to postpone his appearance for an additional six weeks and the hearing was rescheduled for September 15. In early September, Secretary Pierce and his attorneys requested a further delay. I declined to grant that request, but as a special accommodation to Secretary Pierce, I agreed to limit his testimony to only three subjects and to permit him to delay answering any specific question if he felt he needed to review certain relevant documents. Nevertheless, despite a firm agreement and a clear understanding of his responsibility, Secretary Pierce failed to appear at the September 15 hearing. As a result, on September 20th, the subcommittee voted unanimously to subpoena Secretary Pierce. He appeared before the subcommittee under subpoena on September 26, but refused to answer any questions on the basis of his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. I would like to state, as I have done on numerous occasions, that the Fifth Amendment privilege is a shield to the innocent and no inference <clears throat> whatsoever should be drawn from a witness taking the Fifth Amendment. 
Mr. Pierce is once again appearing before this subcommittee under subpoena. We have heard much about Mr. Pierce <coughs> not having enough time to prepare for the hearing. But he has had more than ample time. During the past two months, Mr. Pierce has had more attorneys working on his behalf than the entire cast of LA Law. Mr. Pierce ought to be prepared and willing to answer our questions today. Now, there are a few other matters that I would like to comment on. At the September 26 hearing, I reserved judgment on certain legal issues, namely the reasons given by Secretary Pierce for asserting his Fifth Amendment privilege and whether he had waived his right to assert that privilege by testifying at our May 25 hearing. Now, it is obvious to all of us that no witness may invoke the Fifth Amendment on grounds of a real or fictitious claim of inadequate time to prepare testimony. Likewise, no witness may invoke the Fifth Amendment on real or fictitious grounds that the witness disagrees with the purposes of the panel conducting the investigation. However, since Mr. Pierce stated that he feared self-incrimination, and under the circumstances the possibility of self-incrimination is real, I find that he had a legally sustainable basis for invoking the Fifth Amendment privilege. <clears throat> the next issue I wish to address is whether Mr. Pierce waived his Fifth Amendment rights when he initially testified before this subcommittee on May 25. The answer to this question is more troublesome. While legal experts may differ on this issue, I find that by testifying voluntarily before the subcommittee on May 25, Secretary Pierce waived his Fifth Amendment right to refuse to answer questions that relate to the same subject matter as his earlier testimony. While I have no doubt that the subcommittee would prevail on this issue in a court of law, I choose not to pursue this matter. Accordingly, the subcommittee will not challenge on waiver grounds Mr. Pierce's assertion of his Fifth Amendment privilege. As I've said often, we are not trying to trap anyone. The fact that Mr. Pierce voluntarily testified before the subcommittee in May without the benefit of counsel should not now be used as a weapon to deprive him of important Fifth Amendment rights. The Bill of Rights is one of our most precious national possessions. I value the Bill of Rights far too much to attempt through legal manu maneuvers to deny, to deny Mr. Pierce the invaluable protection guaranteed to him by the Fifth Amendment. I'm also mindful of the fact that if we were to challenge Secretary Pierce's invocation of the Fifth Amendment on waiver grounds, such a course of action would only serve to divert the attention of this subcommittee and the American people from the real issue, abuses at HUD during Mr. Pierce's tenure. Now, there is a footnote I would like to add to my opening statement. Late yesterday afternoon, a letter was uh, delivered uh, to my office requesting, a letter by Mr. Pierce's attorneys, requesting that today's hearing be cancelled and the hearing scheduled for November 3, at which Mr. Pierce again is scheduled to appear under subpoena, be also cancelled. And an indication in the letter that he would be prepared to testify in the near future. I authorize subcommittee staff to contact Mr. Pierce's attorneys 
and indicate that I am prepared to cancel today's hearing, to vacate the, uh, the subpoena and cancel the hearing on November 3 if Mr. Pierce agrees to appear on a voluntary basis at any date of his own choosing prior to the Thanksgiving recess and prepared to answer questions of this subcommittee. Uh, the offer was uh, not accepted, but it is my intention when Mr. Pierce comes before us to again give him this opportunity. He will have a clear option of testifying today under subpoena, testifying at a later date within the next two, two and a half weeks on a voluntary basis. And this will be his choice. Uh, I uh, should also state that uh, subcommittee was advised uh, late yesterday afternoon that uh, Mr. Pierce, through his attorneys, requested the government to pay for his legal representation by private counsel at these congressional hearings. This is not a criminal trial. It is a congressional oversight hearing to examine abuses and mismanagement that occurred at HUD during Mr. Pierce's administration. The scandals at HUD during the Pierce years have already cost the American people billions of dollars. I am pleased that under its new secretary, Mr. Kemp, HUD rejected the request that Mr. Pierce's legal bills at a congressional hearing be paid for by the American taxpayer. Before uh, calling the witness, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, my colleagues to make any comment if they wish. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes. Mr. Chairman, I would just uh, like to uh, state to you and to all of those people who are here that I believe your letter is a very reasonable and very responsible statement of this committee's position and I concur in it and commend you for the approach that you have taken in the letter. I understand that you have made it a part of the public record, uh, which I think is desirable, and to state to everyone that I think there should be no doubt that it represents a bipartisan agreement as to the approach that this committee should be taking, and I commend you for it. I want to thank my friend from Arizona. Uh, the letter will be made part of the proceedings of this hearing without objection. Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the statement of the gentleman from Arizona, which I think uh, we all agree with. I just wanted to say a few words about the Fifth Amendment and the proper role of the Congressional Committee. I think your statement went a long way to making it clear, but I think we have to reaffirm a couple of points. First of all, we have all, I think, shown an absolute scrupulous regard for any individual's right to invoke the self-incrimination clause of the Fifth Amendment as a reason not to testify. And nothing this committee has done has in any way impinged on that. In fact, I think we have affirmed it. It's a central principle of American constitutional law, and we've been very respectful of it. What many of us have insisted is that one who invokes the potential of self-incrimination is not the potential. One isn't claiming that he or she is sure to be incriminated, only that there's a potential for it. But that when one invokes that, the only justification is, in fact, the possibility of self-incrimination. Not having had enough time, as we have, I hope, made very clear, is not relevant. Another argument which I think ought to be dealt with came in the letter that you received today from the very able counsel for Mr. Pierce. In the last paragraph it said, uh, it is a hope that sometime in the near future the present level of tension may be reduced so that Mr. Pierce can reconsider his present position. I think we ought to again affirm there is nothing in the Fifth Amendment about tension. The Fifth Amendment does not say 
that the atmosphere is too tense and therefore I will not testify. Uh, it says that I might be incriminated. And I think we want to insist again and again. An individual has a right to invoke self-incrimination. An individual does not have the right to cloak that invocation with other arguments which are in fact legally quite irrelevant to it. And time, time is a legitimate one in and of itself. And I think it's very clear to anyone who's been following these hearings. The chairman of this subcommittee, with the full support of the members, has been very respectful of any legitimate requests we've gotten for more time. No one has been hurried. No one has been denied a chance to clarify, to come back later. There have been periodic reschedulings. We've had hearings canceled, postponed, all because of the time problem. So we just want to make it very clear that self-incrimination is there, and it is a right that can be invoked, but it means what it means, and it doesn't mean that there's too much tension. It doesn't mean, uh, let's be also very clear, the possibility that members of the subcommittee will be rude is not a reason not to testify. If uh, congressional proceedings could be halted because of the potential rudeness of members of Congress, our processes would work even more slowly than they do, and we would never adjourn for the year. Um, none of those are legitimate. Self-incrimination is a legitimate right, but it is uh, what it says. Beyond that, I would say this with regard to Secretary Pierce, and people have asked why he was being asked to come today. My understanding in his previous references to the Fifth Amendment had to do with time and with other factors as well as the basic plea. My own view was this, any time a witness comes before us and makes an unambiguous assertion that he or she pleads self-incrimination and the potential of self-incrimination is the reason for not testifying, to me that's sufficient not to recall the individual. If an individual comes and says that, if someone says I have to plead self-incrimination and I don't have enough time, it seems to me that's an invitation to wait a while and come back again and see whether time has changed his or her mind. But where the plea is on its own merits, that seems to me to be sufficient. Now, as I understand it, as I've read the correspondence and listened, we haven't yet heard that from Secretary Pierce. The day we do, it does seem to me that uh, the proceedings ought to, with regard to him, cease. Uh, if someone makes it very clear that he or she is not going to testify on self-incrimination grounds, then no further purpose is served. Finally, I just want to reaffirm, because I think it's always important for us to do that, the absolute relevance of these hearings and of the questions that we have sought to put to every witness to the legislative and oversight mandates of this subcommittee. People sometimes have raised questions in the past about the rights of witnesses and the purposes of subcommittee investigations. I think it is very clear that this subcommittee investigation has been focused on matters that are clearly not just within the jurisdiction of this subcommittee, but which it is our absolute duty to look into. And uh, we ought to affirm that. No one is being asked to come here and swear and give testimony for any other reason than this committee's constitutional and legislative mandate to investigate the way programs are uh, functioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me just state for the record that <clears throat> Mr. Pierce will be asked this morning whether it will be his intention, should he take the Fifth Amendment today, to take the Fifth Amendment again at the November 3 hearing, and if his answer will be in the affirmative, um, the chairman will, uh, will excuse Mr. Pierce from appearing at that hearing. Congressman Shays. Chairman, I wish to associate myself with the remarks of my Republican colleague, Mr. Kyle, in uh, expressing full support for your letter of October 26 and the way um, this committee has conducted the hearings, uh, the 20 hearings that we've had and the 50 witnesses that have come before us. Um, I'd be the first to admit that um, there are perhaps times when any of the members here have said things they wish they hadn't, but for the most part, uh, I've been very proud to associate myself with every member and every remark that the members have made at this hearing. Um, I would also like to say that, that I would not have um, put forward a motion to have Mr. Pierce come for three appearances here if in the first appearance it had been clear to us that he would not, uh, he would choose to evoke his Fifth Amendment privilege uh, based on something solely other than what he had said, that he simply needed more time. It's very clear that if he appeared in May and requested a, an extension from July and another extension in August, and then he, he didn't show up in September 15th, and now in uh, late September he appeared before us, and now it's October 27th. If he says that he intends to invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege, uh, I certainly uh, don't want to see him again. Thank you very much. Again, I'm very pleased to welcome to the subcommittee Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to join my colleagues um, in commending you for your letter of October 26th. Um, I believe your judgment about the legal issues on the Fifth Amendment is a wise one. I think also 
your judgment not to press the issue of uh, the waiver and thereby divert the attention of the Congress and the country and uh, ultimately the Justice Department <laughs> from the real issues in this case is an appropriate, uh, is an appropriate decision. Uh, I'd also uh, uh, suggest that, um, uh, that something that uh, ought to be commented upon is the, the submissions of the of counsel for, for Secretary Pierce to this um, committee regarding the Fifth Amendment issue uh, were interesting in the, um, in the apparent lack of uh, respect for the First Amendment rights of the members of this panel. Um, uh, a misunderstanding of whether this uh, panel was sitting in judgment in some kind of jury, jury type of, of role, thereby suggesting that First Amendment statements by members of this committee and people sitting with this committee about their beliefs about these events and their beliefs about potential criminal liability were somehow out of bounds. Uh, we are not a jury. Uh, we do not pass on the guilt or innocence of people who come before us. And the members who sit here have every right, in fact, every responsibility to express to each other and to the American people their beliefs about what has happened here. And it is for the Justice Department and the courts and an American jury to decide whether crimes were committed. But we certainly are entitled to have an opinion about that. I'd also suggest that I was very disturbed to learn from your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, that there seems to be another round of cat and mouse uh, being played with this subcommittee. Uh, the suggestion that there was some, uh, some hoop that we could jump through that would get Secretary Pierce before us in a voluntary way to answer our questions, but you just can't seem to find it. You always have the wrong date or the wrong forum or the wrong time, and I really suggest that we're, we're playing a game that was started a while ago, and I think it's an unfortunate game. Finally, uh, I want to reiterate my belief that, um, that there are very serious issues of criminal conduct that surround this investigation. Uh, in defense against the testimony here, even though we're not apparently going to hear it from the witness table, representatives of Secretary Pierce are quoted in the media saying that we were lied to by Ms. Wiseman. Uh, and that's, uh, that, that testimony that, uh, that, that has been brought up with respect to Secretary Pierce suggesting inappropriate pressure on Ms. Wiseman uh, was a lie. Well, somebody must have lied to us then, since Secretary Pierce said one thing and Ms. Wiseman said another. Um, somebody's not telling us the truth. And again, in the media, we have reported that Mr. Monticello told us certain things about what was done in the New York regional office and what relationship that had to Senator D'Amato. And now we have the chief economist of that regional office, Mr. Burns, quoted in the media, saying that those statements are untrue. Somebody's not telling the truth in this investigation, and I hope the Justice Department is watching and listening and not taking the hands-off attitude that I fear they've been. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to call on my distinguished colleague from New York, Mr. Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, let me uh, thank you for your graciousness in inviting Bruce Morrison and I and Marge Rockham of the Housing Committee to sit in. Let me also say, Mr. Chairman, I think this is an appropriate time to just commend you on the outstanding job you have done. These hearings are clearly at a crossroads right now. And uh, you have led them in an exemplary way. I think that you have been straightforward, honest. You've given every witness every opportunity. You've been gracious. And yet you haven't let all the diversions that many have placed in your way to get in the way of the ultimate purpose of these hearings, which is to find out what the heck went on in that HUD for eight years. We now leave this hearing to fulfill our commitment to bring our viewers live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the U.S. House of Representatives. Check for periodic schedule updates to find out when these proceedings will air in their entirety. For viewers who want to know more about C-SPAN, we publish a weekly newspaper called the C-SPAN Update. It's a useful companion to your C-SPAN.